Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the September 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal, and Fascist Violence by Ajamu Umi. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this is one of the few texts that I've done on the channel which was not found at Marxists.org. So thanks in this case to Sunni LaBeouf on Twitter for running a Discord server which hosts Marxist theory. I'll put a link to that in the video description. So let's get into the audiobook. Acknowledgements. Without the selfless examples of the following African and other comrade organizations and entities, we would not today be able to envision the potential of mass work to challenge institutionalized systems of oppression. So we begin this manual by thanking those often unheralded and unknown faces who contribute and contributed so much to enable us to have the opportunity to advance our struggles towards eternal victory. This list is certainly incomplete, but it is an attempt to recognize the honest and valuable contributions these bodies have provided that are often either maligned or ignored. Universal Negro Improvement Association, African Blood Brotherhood, Convention People's Party, the Democratic Party of Guinea, African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau, Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, Azanian People's Organization, Land and Freedom Movement, Mau Mau, Pan-African Union of Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe Movement for Pan-African Socialists, Amilcar Cabral Ideological School, African Maroon Societies, African Indigenous Quilombo Societies, the Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, Black Consciousness Movement, Pan-African Revolutionary Socialist Party, All African People's Revolutionary Party, Revolutionary Action Movement, Nation of Islam, Black Alliance for Peace, New African People's Organization, Republic of New Africa, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Cooperation Jackson, Black Hammer, Palestine Liberation Organization, American Indian Movement, International Indian Treaty Council, Red Nations, Four Directions, Irish Republican Socialist Party, Network of North America, Anak Bayan, Gabriela, El Partido La Raza Unida, Union del Barrio, Brown Berets, Socialist Cuba, Socialist Venezuela, Socialist Bolivia, the Libyan Jamahiria, the Viet Minh Front, Young Koreans United. Definition of Terms Africans All people of African descent, wherever born or living. AAPRP The All African People's Revolutionary Party The political party Kwame Nkrumah initiated to serve as the governing body under one unified socialist Africa. AACPC, the All-African Committee for Political Coordination. The Central Committee coordinators from various revolutionary Pan-African formations who unite to form one coordination body for Africa and African liberation efforts. AAPRA, All-African People's Revolutionary Army. The United Military Force for One Unified Socialist Africa. Capitalism, the dominant economic system on Earth today where all the resources on earth are owned and controlled by private corporate interests for the purpose of exploiting those resources for private profit. Culture, the basis from which a people define their specific existence within the world, a people's methodology in engaging the world and creating their legacy. Democratic centralism, the process of democratic collective decision making. Europeans, all people descending from the continent of Europe, Homophobia, a system of institutionalized discrimination against people who do not function within the gender binary paradigm of people being either men or women and or relationships being defined strictly as a pairing of a man and a woman. Ideology, the values that define how a people operate within the world. Ideology defines how you interpret and interact with society and what interests you pursue in society. Indigenous people, 
the original inhabitants and their descendants of the Western Hemisphere. Liberation, eliminating oppressive conditions against a people. Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of the African continent under one scientific socialist government. Patriarchy, a system of institutionalized discrimination against women identifying persons and all persons who do not function as men in society. Imperialism, the international system where capitalist countries branch out to other countries to control and exploit their natural and human resources. Scientific socialism, an economic system where the world's human and material resources are owned and facilitated by the masses of people to be organized to serve the needs of the masses of humanity. So that's the end of the glossary. And those are how those terms are being used in this book. You know, I'm sure everybody has, you know, their own little definition or, you know, would change this or that, but that's how they're using them in this pamphlet. So chapter one, introduction, the definition and objectives of revolutionary community defense work, our revolutionary pan-Africanist work. This manual is written in the spirit of the African liberation resistance struggle. More specifically, the international pan-Africanist revolutionary struggle articulated through the vision of Kwame Nkrumah in his classic work, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. Nkrumah, understanding the conditions that led to imperialism's destabilization of the Congo in 1960 and 61, the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency's known role in overthrowing his legitimate government in Ghana in 1966, and the neo-colonialist plague that has strangled Africa and African people everywhere, wrote the HORW in 1968 as a guide on how to organize for Pan-Africanism against all systems of oppression. What Nkrumah shared with us in the handbook is that the true liberation of the African masses cannot and will not take place within the structural confines of the international capitalist and imperialist system. This liberation will only result when we achieve power for the organized masses of African people. Power that can only come from a mass grassroots organizing effort by Africans everywhere, focused on the liberation of our mother, Africa. This objective, properly defined and achieved, is Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism, or TTL-UASS. To facilitate this mass organizing process, in the handbook, Nkrumah calls for the creation of an All-African Committee for Political Coordination, or AACPC. The AACPC would constitute all revolutionary Pan-Africanist formations who have TTL-UASS as their objective and who agree to come together to form one unified fighting force for Africa. In the handbook, Nkrumah argues that the AACPC is the body that will coordinate the work to liberate Africa and the African world towards Pan-Africanism. Once Africa achieves unity, Nkrumah identifies the All African People's Revolutionary Party, or AAPRP, as the entity that will govern the entire African continent through a scientific socialist construction and development process. For revolutionary Pan-Africanists, Pan-Africanism is the objective which will, as Nkrumah articulated, fulfill the aspirations of Africans and people of African descent everywhere. This continental government, AACPC building to AAPRP, operating on a continental socialist model, will coordinate and facilitate Africa's vast mineral wealth being utilized to finally meet the needs of the masses of African people everywhere. This revolutionary struggle will interrupt the current process where Africa's massive mineral wealth simply serves to further enrich the exploiters, oppressors, and enemies of Africa and all of humanity. The vision of the handbook is being carried out today by the All African People's Revolutionary Party, AAPRP, through its work over the last 50 years to solidify the building blocks for the AACPC. Of course, we recognize that today's AAPRP is not the AAPRP Nkrumah calls for in the handbook but the infant AAPRP of today, along with multiple other Pan-Africanist formations who accept the vision and work spelled out in the handbook, are laying out the necessary pieces of work required to create conditions for the AAPRP we want and need. 
What this work looks like is these entities helping to build unity with pan-Africanist formations, like the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau, or PAIGC, the Pan-African Union of Sierra Leone, or PANAFU, the Democratic Party of Guinea, PDG, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, South Africa, PAC, the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo, and the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School of Nigeria, ACIS, and other organizations. Altogether, what this represents are millions of Africans from several parts of Africa, agreeing and working towards one unified socialist Africa on the ground. And this work hasn't come out of nowhere. What Nkrumah did after writing the handbook was to form the first work-study group for this new revolutionary pan-Africanist formation that he and the participants agreed would be called the first organizing element for the AAPRP in Guinea Conarchy in 1968. The original participants of this first circle were Nkrumah, the former president of Ghana and the co-president of Guinea, Amilcar Cabral, the founder of the PAIGC. The PAIGC was training in Guinea at the time to overthrow Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau. Kwame Touré, then known as Stokely Carmichael, the young leader for the U.S. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and the prime minister for the U.S. Black Panther Party, and Lamin Janga, a 17-year-old student from Gambia and former Young Pioneer Institute participant under Nkrumah's Convention People's Party in Ghana. It must also be noted that this initial work was taking place in guinea Conarchy under the protection of the Democratic Party of Guinea and its president, Soko Touré. That initial AAPRP circle tasked Nkrumah with continuing to work to remove the neocolonialist domination in Ghana that overthrew his government. Cabral was tasked with continuing to build PAIGC into a force that would eventually defeat the Portuguese in Guinea-Bissau and the other Portuguese-controlled territories of Angola and Mozambique, while also shaping the PAIGC into the type of revolutionary pan-African political formation that would help lead within the AACPC, AAPRP. Touré and Jango were tasked with helping build the AAPRP throughout the African diaspora. The PAIGC, along with the Cabral-founded Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, and the Mozambique Liberation Front, Frelimo, effectively ran the Portuguese out of Africa and the PAIGC today continues to serve as a leading formation in revolutionary pan-African work. AAPRP cadre have been and continue to be developed throughout Europe, the U.S., the Caribbean, and of course Africa. Ghana remains neo-colonialist, but the work in Africa is intensifying to bring those contradictions to a heightened stage. One thing we would argue was not as clearly spelled out within the handbook was what preparation those Africans within the diaspora should carry out to contribute to this work to build the AACPC. The AAPRP organizers have done outstanding work building the revolutionary consciousness for Pan-Africanism throughout Africa, Europe, Canada, and the Americas. But beyond that ideal of Pan-Africanism, we haven't given Africans within the diaspora a clear perspective on what role they will play specifically in the diaspora while the AACPC is being built in Africa. Many AAPRP cadre have taken initiative to address this challenge by creating mechanisms to further support AACPC work on the ground in Africa. This has been done by building and maintaining relationships with new and previously existing potential AACPC organizations, along with ongoing ideological support and material assistance in Ghana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Azania, South Africa, Guinea, Bissau, Guinea, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Kenya, Gambia, etc. Some cadre have physically uprooted from the Western Hemisphere and moved to Africa to play active roles in AACPC and other Pan-African unity work on the ground there. All of these efforts are overwhelmingly important and have made major contributions toward the creation of the AACPC and the full manifestation of the AAPRP as the mass revolutionary political party that Nkrumah envisioned when producing the handbook. The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare and Africans Outside of Africa. This manual is designed to speak directly to Africans living within the U.S. who wish to contribute to Pan-African work, AACPC, AAPRP. 
and desire an on-the-ground model for this work that will concretize participation through U.S. AAPRP work-study circles and political education work. The focus of this manual will be on the U.S., but the suggestion here is that similar work needs also to take place within the Caribbean, Europe, Canada, Central and South America. Africans live and exist in all those places, and universally we suffer from capitalist exploitation of our labor, white supremacist subjugation of our existence, and patriarchal oppression of women and women identifying persons. We want to make it abundantly clear that we see all people of African descent as Africans who belong to the African nation, and through our work, we are striving to contribute towards making that work result in the achievement of one unified socialist Africa fully realized. We believe to attempt to address the particular organizing needs for Africans in Europe and the Americas outside of the U.S. would overreach and diminish the specific focus needed in each of these areas of the world. So instead, this manual will focus on Africans within the U.S., and we encourage and support the creation of similar documents to support AACPC, AAPRP work through the handbook in the non-U.S. areas of the diaspora to advance upon the contribution this manual attempts to make. The challenge is broad enough just looking at the U.S., and it's clear that distinct roles in this fight should be carried out by Africans based on the conditions under which they exist. For Africans in Central, South America, and the Caribbean, for example, this defense work may be focused on how we interact with the agricultural industries located in those regions to enable us to seize control of those industries when appropriate. Since the U.S. is the current belly of the capitalist beast worldwide, the role of Africans here will be a very specific one. It is this point that this manual will attempt to provide some guidance on how Africans in the U.S. should move to organize effectively against this empire. Since the wealth of capitalism everywhere is based on exploiting Africa, we will only achieve one unified socialist Africa when the center of capitalism and world imperialism, the U.S., is no more. Africans in the U.S. obviously play a central role in this element of the fight. Since we believe Africa is primary for all African people, that means we recognize and respect the fact that the U.S. and all of the Americas are the natural and national homeland of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. Africans will also play a pivotal role in supporting indigenous people here in achieving their self-determination. Why community defense work? The core purpose of revolutionary community defense has to always be getting people organized for liberation on a consistent basis. The weakness of movements for justice today is that the majority of people are not involved in those movements. In fact, a large portion of the population, overwhelmed with bourgeois idealism, actually believe in Hollywood models, where a few people can save the masses of people. Capitalism advances individualism as a primary value on a 24-7, 365 basis. As a result, most people are socialized to view the world from the perspective of their individual, subjective experiences, and to be arrogant in protecting their right to view the world that way. Consequently, a central task of revolutionary organizers is to get people involved in the struggle for justice on practical levels that crush bourgeois notions that it's possible to know more about the struggle for justice from watching TV, videos, and movies, or gaining a PhD from capitalist media outlets, than it is by actually participating in the movement. Kwame Torre was always fond of saying that the only way you can speak with authority about physics is by studying it. Millions of people watch soccer, U.S. football, basketball, etc., and although they themselves have never played the game, especially in front of thousands of live fans, with the level of pressure these athletes play under, most people watching still believe they are qualified to critique the performance of these players. It's quite possible that you can watch something and develop a valid perspective from doing so, but clearly the most effective way to properly understand something is from actual experience engaging that thing. With our struggle for justice and liberation, there is no degree of sideline observation that will bring about our liberation. Only the active participation of the masses of the people in our liberation struggle will achieve it. Revolutionary community defense is a strategy to involve Africans on the ground throughout the diaspora in struggles to build capacity for their specific neighborhoods to battle oppression. At the same time, this work is providing them with a worldwide revolutionary pan-African consciousness 
and commitment to see their neighborhood work as part and parcel of the necessary effort to construct the international fighting force that we need to be victorious against the international system that created and maintains our oppression. Europeans who wish to organize for justice. Another purpose of this manual is to address European or white people within the U.S. who understand the system of capitalism must be destroyed. These people cannot be ignored. No war strategist wins by completely dismissing the population that provides the largest resistance to your liberation efforts. Working class Europeans within the U.S. and everywhere else have always served as the shock troops for imperialism. They make up the bulk of the police, military, and prison industrial complexes from capitalist countries that serve to dominate, repress, and oppress African people and all of humanity endlessly. Europeans are the participants in white supremacist violence against us that only serves the interests of the state. We as Pan-Africanists are working to organize our people. We do not have the capacity, the social ability, or the responsibility to organize the masses of Europeans. Plus, the institutionalization of white supremacy would make such an effort impossible anyway. What we can do is provide those Europeans who don't wish to side with capitalism and imperialism with an analysis that they can hopefully customize and utilize to organize their people in ways similar to how we are organizing our people. If Europeans are not organized, our burden is much greater. So why not share our models with them to help them to organize their people? That just makes sense for us to do this. So this community defense manual is designed for all justice-loving communities, but we emphasize again that the primary purpose of this manual must be to provide an active complement to our work on the ground in Africa to bring about one unified socialist Africa. Chapter 2. The Current State of Africa and the African Diaspora Within the U.S. Africa Today. Africa Today can be summarized as a continent dominated by foreign interests. There are over a billion people living in Africa today in 54 countries. There are 58 territories connected to Africa, counting the islands around the continental land base. Africa today produces about 75% of the cocoa used to make chocolate products. The continent provides a large percentage of the world's oil for heating purposes and fuel. Most of the diamonds and gold produced today originate from Africa. Columbite tantalite, or coltan, cobalt, is the mineral ore that once ground down into a powder holds electrical charges which facilitate digital technology. Cellular phones, laptop computers, flat screen televisions, pretty much any device that sends and receives a signal to function cannot exist without this mineral ore and it's only found in plentiful supplies in Central and Southern Africa. It's so valuable that it can sell for almost 600 US dollars per pound. African bauxite, uranium, zinc, flowers, and other raw materials supply most of what is used on the world market in the production of automobiles, nuclear power capacity, aluminum products, and much, much more. What's essential to know about all of this is the vast toll extracting these resources is taking on Africa from the standpoint of the tremendous amount of wealth that is leaving Africa without stopping to benefit everyday Africans. The overwhelming physical toll the work takes on our people and the devastating environmental consequences from this exploitative process. The result is an Africa that is poor and very unstable because this environment benefits the forces who profit from these conditions. The conflicts that constantly arise in Africa can all be traced to these exploitative industries and the push to ensure imperialism maintains control over these markets. By imperialism, we of course mean the industrial capitalist countries led by the US, Europe, etc. These entities always downplay the importance of Africa, but the levels of resources and people they place in Africa to maintain the current systems of oppression tell us otherwise. The U.S. currently has almost 100 military installations throughout Africa, and not one of them is there to build anything for the people. Instead, this military presence exists to quell and help train African neo-colonialists to crush resistance to the rampant oppression these industries facilitate. This military effort costs billions annually to U.S. taxpayers, most of whom have absolutely no idea it exists. If you just look at the Congo, Imperialism has fomented instability and absolute chaos in that country nonstop since the 1950s 
in order to ensure capitalism's interests are protected. The blatant gangsterism carried out in the process, where literally millions of innocent lives have been brutally lost, is enacted with such confidence by these international thieves that the Hollywood movie industry blatantly produces mainstream motion pictures that display this horrific treatment of African people. Actor Sean Penn starred in a movie called The Gunman, which tells the tale of a European mining company in Africa. It could be the Congo, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, Ghana, any place in Africa, that has him assassinate the country's mining minister, who wants to nationalize the country's resources, to ensure that the European company can continue its theft of resources there. Although it's a fictional account, this movie pretty much tells the tale about Africa today. And there are many movies like that one, but again, most people within the U.S. are completely oblivious to their complacent role in supporting this terrorism, including most Africans in the U.S. Clearly, one unified socialist Africa is a solution that places African people in the driver's seat to control those vast resources and use them through socialist development to advance the masses of Africans in Africa and everywhere throughout the African world. Of course, imperialism has killed and exploited far too many and built its empire on this model to simply decide one day to return all of the resources they have stolen to the masses of African people. Nkrumah recognized this in the handbook. That's why the third organizing entity he proposed after the AACPC and the AAPRP is the All African People's Revolutionary Army, or AAPRA, which will serve as our collective military arm to drive the imperialists out of Africa. This is precisely the work the AAPRP has been engaged in with its AACPC work over the last 50 years, and that work will continue and intensify. At this stage, though, the primary struggle in Africa is one of political education, because contrary to popular opinion amongst Africans in the U.S., the education system in Africa is the same neo-colonial, pro-imperialism education that Africans in the U.S. receive. So, our AACPC work today consists primarily of building the consciousness of Africans throughout Africa towards our objective of pan-Africanism. There are plenty of indications that this message is taking strong roots throughout Africa. A question we ponder is how will the African masses in the U.S. respond while this consciousness translates to active struggle to overthrow imperialism in Africa? That's the purpose of this manual, to give some analysis on the role of Africans within the U.S. in developing community defense models to assist in this worldwide pan-African effort for justice and liberation, while also providing a model for other communities to prepare for massive resistance to capitalism on an international basis. Africans in the U.S. Today The African population within the U.S. will forever serve as a problem for the imperialists. This is exactly the reason the system works so hard to repress our people. They know that we are the shock troops here for Pan-African revolution taking place in Africa. They know that they cannot have 50 million Africans running around here uncontrolled while imperialism is savagely exploiting Africa. Often, Africans and other well-meaning people misinterpret this phenomenon. Since education about Africa is so non-existent, the very real connection of Africans in the U.S. to Africa is easily dismissed. Most everyone in the U.S. suffers painful ignorance about Africa. So to them, the continent doesn't seem to have any obvious relevance to their daily lives. Consequently, the conclusion is most often that Africa must not be too important. As a result of this confusion, the clear systematic oppression of Africans in the U.S. is credited to this nebulous concept known as anti-blackness. The only anti-blackness is the necessity of capitalism and imperialism to feed itself from robbing Africa blind. The oppression against the African masses in the U.S. results because our people were never intended, despite our concerted efforts to force the issue, to fit into this society. Many of us are too traumatized to accept that to the capitalist system, our only purpose here is cheap labor. As a result, the stark reality is the masses of African people in the U.S. are simply in the way in the minds of this power structure and the majority of Europeans and other misinformed nationalities in this country. Abe Lincoln said it when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation ending chattel slavery in 1863. He said if it were practically feasible, since our primary purpose of slave labor was ending, he would have favored sending us all to Africa. 
So when racists tell us to go back to Africa, that's not just some random aberration from a deranged individual. That's a reflection of the fabric of this country since colonialists breached these shores. When something is in the way and has no value to you, it becomes easy to discard of that something. In the US today, the capitalist system needs African mineral resources, but it doesn't need Africans in the US. So its daily operations, from the police to business, politics, faith practices and social services, are all designed to keep us controlled and under thumb, to watch us while they continue to steal what they need from our mother. Our enemies are smart enough to recognize that the fact we're ignorant about our connection to Africa today in no way ensures this ignorance will exist tomorrow. So since they remain organized against us, they oppress us ruthlessly to ensure that they're not caught off guard when we wake up and realize that wherever we live, our salvation is tied to Africa's future. This is the daily experience and reality for the African masses throughout the U.S., and this will continue to be reality until Africa is free, unified, and socialist. Until that happens, even if many of us have no collective vision and plan for ourselves, rest assured that our enemies have their vision and plan for us. This is why community defense models are so critical to helping our people get prepared for this fight. Most of our people are confused about all of this. Many of us already believe or want to believe that we're Americans. The institutions of imperialism have been set up to spread this confusion amongst our people. If we see ourselves as Americans, we will not be inclined to pay attention to what's happening in Africa, and we certainly won't see doing something to stop it as our responsibility. Also, we will continue to see respecting and protecting the U.S. as our responsibility instead of seeing destroying this empire as essential to our freedom. We will believe the propaganda of our enemies that the U.S. is helping Africa with everything that it's doing. We will also believe that regardless of what traumas this backward country dumps on us, the absolute only opportunities available to us can only exist within the confines of the U.S. and its exploitative capitalist system. We will believe that anyone who attempts to present an alternative vision outside the realm of U.S. capitalism is insane. The Capitalist Empire Further, the other more insidious element of U.S. propaganda on Africans in the U.S. is this subtle notion that the U.S. is the best country on Earth. This story advances the lie that the U.S. is the citadel of democracy and that everyone can become rich and prosperous in the U.S. if you just apply enough individual effort. Of course, if you're not successful in this endeavor, which practically everyone is not, then it's simply because you're flawed and not up to the task. For this backward analysis, the contradiction is never the system. The problem here is that imperialism has told us for centuries that this is the wealthiest country because it worked so hard to become that. And all you need to do is join that dedicated workforce and your dreams too will come true. The truth is that the U.S. is the wealthiest country in the world because it stole free labor and land. It exploited and exploits African resources. The transatlantic slave trade financed the development of the capitalist system. This is irrefutable. The banking and insurance industries only came to fruition from seed money provided by African slave labor, but most Africans, especially those within the U.S., don't know this. Most people overall within the U.S., are oblivious to these historical facts. So most of us believe siding with the U.S. means being on the winning side. And everyone wants to be a winner. So many Africans, mostly well-intentioned but overwhelmingly uninformed, buy into this propaganda that we have a stake in the U.S. For example, the belief that we built the U.S. is really code language for we created this wealth so we're entitled to a piece of it. The reality of how the wealth was gained, as was just stated before, escapes or isn't a priority to many of these Africans, who have consciously made class decisions to side with the enemies of African people in the hopes that doing so will bring them personal financial success. This is important to point out because there are petty bourgeois Africans everywhere who adopt this sellout mentality, and there are even some misdirected Africans within the U.S. who, because of their own dishonest class objectives, choose to paint Africans born outside of the U.S. as Africans who somehow betrayed Africans in the U.S. This analysis, reaped in opportunism and disunity, fails to acknowledge that there are plenty of Africans in the U.S. who sell us out daily. As Malcolm X told us, 
there have always been house Negroes and field Negroes. This contradiction reflects class struggle among African people, regardless of where we are born and are living. So, much of the basis of these community defense models is to provide ongoing political education to the masses of Africans in the U.S. while initiating concrete work to demonstrate to them that Africans can be independent. And we can work together across colonial borders to solve our problems. We can build communities internationally. And those communities can connect with our own societies, Africa. And our societies can be productive and beneficial to all our people and the rest of humanity, Pan-Africanism. Chapter 3, A Case for Organizing Africans Against the Capitalist System. Africans within the U.S. face a multitude of oppressive forces. Police agencies shoot us down in the streets. And if they aren't unjustifiably shooting us, they prey on us to provide cheap labor through mass incarceration and to provide revenue for municipal coffers by disproportionately targeting us for anything that can be construed as a violation. We are ruthlessly discriminated against in job seeking, housing, and even the most casual acts of living life. The schools miseducate our children to believe that all they can hope for in life is acceptance by the white supremacist capitalist system, and most of our adults, already trained in this dysfunctional model, play significant roles in perpetuating this anti-African propaganda among our people. Most of the religious institutions our people participate in, whether Christian, Islam, etc., promote values that are friendly to capitalism and antagonistic to revolution, socialism, and African self-determination. The core reason for the suppression is the reliance of imperialism on the continued theft of Africa's vast mineral resources. The results of this level of systemic oppression against the African masses are twofold. One, we continue to mount consistent and sustained resistance wherever we are on Earth. That resistance is almost always spontaneous and reactive, but still, it happens everywhere. Secondly, we find ourselves on the bottom of every society we inhabit in the world today. This is no accident, but the result of the capitalist systems need to keep us directly under its thumb at all times. Its reliance on our homeland requires it to ensure that we never manage to develop the capacity to confront it successfully. Consequently, our people are constantly propagandized against our interests. We're told all over the world 24-7 in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Swahili, and in every other language that we are cursed by God. We are incapable of leading ourselves, our families are dysfunctional, and every problem we have is the direct result of our incompetence. The truth, of course, is the opposite of this. The level of love and support we as a people have been able to provide to ourselves within the wretched state we're forced to endure is overwhelmingly impressive. All this boils down to the reality that the oppression African people face is a worldwide phenomenon that's powered by the capitalist system, the dominant economic system in the world today. If we understand and accept this, we have to also face the reality that since the problem originated and is maintained on an international level, the problem cannot in any way be addressed on a micro-state basis. In other words, the British, French, and U.S. economies, some of the leading capitalist economies in the world, are built and sustained on exploiting Africa, and those systems maintain their power through brutal oppression of the African masses, the Africans living in Britain, France and the U.S., who cannot effectively address the problems they face without figuring out how to take down the worldwide capitalist system which oppresses all of us. We cannot win freedom in Britain alone, or France alone, or the U.S. alone, etc., because all of those economies are based on exploiting our homeland and our people all over the world. So, any so-called progress Africans within the U.S., for example, can make on an individual basis by advancing through the U.S. capitalist system is always going to be based on perpetuating the oppression of Africans in other parts of the world, particularly Africa. So, as attractive as it may appear to some to have the opportunity to integrate into the capitalist system, since that system is based on our exploitation, this alleged integration can only be on a token basis, since any wholesale acceptance of us into the capitalist system 
would have to compromise its basis of operation. It isn't possible to permit the people your success is based on to have the opportunity to advance within that system on anything beyond a token level, just enough to keep providing unrealistic hopes within that community that they too can break through. So, for any African sincerely dedicated to the emancipation of the African masses, the only true solution must be a worldwide effort of African people uniting to overthrow capitalism. The antithesis of the worldwide capitalist system is a worldwide socialist system. The reason for this is capitalism is an economic system where the means of production are owned and controlled by private enterprise for the purpose of private profit. Socialism is a system where the means of production are owned by the masses of people for collective good. Since capitalism is the system that placed us in this situation while maintaining and depending upon us staying in this condition, no solution to our reality could ever be based on capitalist operation. As Kwame Torre was fond of saying, the question is, who will own and control the means of production? The question can only be answered two ways. Either some will own it, or everyone will own it. We select the everyone will own it option. And we embrace that option from an African cultural perspective of achieving socialist revolution. Nothing against Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, etc., we appreciate, respect, and admire their contributions. But our solution can only be contained with our revolutionary African personality and cultural context. Our socialist solution is tied to our historical circumstances. It's tied to Africa's liberation. Our socialism is connected to one unified socialist Africa, e.g. Pan-Africanism. So for us, the question is, how do we go about achieving the Pan-Africanism we need? Obviously, we're working against the most powerful system in human history. Our collective success is reliant on an unprecedented level of organization among African people everywhere. That requires a collective strategy we must employ to bring about the results we're looking for. Nkrumah, in the handbook, gave us the blueprint for creating the mechanism for African unity focused on Africa being primary. Since the core of our pan-Africanist effort will take place in Africa, the other question is how will we employ the masses of African people across the diaspora in this work? This is where the community defense models come into play. The strategy within the handbook provides the basis for this work in Africa, and the intention of this manual is to provide a complementary model for Africans born within the U.S. In other words, the idea here is the community defense model will complement the work for Pan-Africanism in Africa. These combined efforts will strengthen our work all over the world, which makes our ability to achieve our objective that much more feasible. Chapter 4. Methodology for Approaching Community Defense Work Equals Political Education Structures The approach to building community defense models within the U.S. is based on providing the African masses in this country with the opportunity to create space for themselves to alleviate some of the worst oppression we face on a daily basis. Meanwhile, we will become able to strengthen our understanding of how this system of oppression works. As a result of that growing consciousness, we will better understand our connection to our people in other parts of the world, especially Africa. This will bring closer into focus the larger vision of what we are fighting for, Pan-Africanism. Once we have that, we will begin to understand how we can play a pivotal role, as people living within the belly of the beast, in helping apply overwhelming pressure to the system while our people in Africa are fighting. Imagine all of our people making this type of contribution everywhere we are. This system, which seems invincible to many of us today, would instantly come tumbling down to its knees. So, the core to achieving this objective is in basing revolutionary community defense work in political education. What we mean is requiring and ensuring that all community defense work is rooted in an ongoing political education program. This program must contain several essential elements. Political education programmatic structure. 1. Areas of study that contain multiple books on specific topics. A. African history. B. National liberation, revolutionary pan-Africanism. C. Capitalism and the history of class struggle. D. Revolution and scientific socialism. E. Patriarchy and the history of women identifying persons. F gender binary. Explaining the justifications behind these revolutionary political education focuses. Why anti-capitalist and pro-socialist? 
An anti-capitalist foundation for all revolutionary community defense work is essential. The introductory chapters have already reaffirmed the terrorist history of how this country was built on the theft of indigenous lands and the kidnapping of Africans to work for free as property for hundreds of years. The so-called Industrial Revolution, which fueled the development of the capitalist system, was financed by the chattel enslavement of the African masses. The tactics of colonialism and slavery were utilized to establish and institutionalize the systems of inequality and oppression that still operate on a dominant level today. Capitalism is the absolute reason that the masses of African people everywhere on earth today are exploited and oppressed. Consequently, there is no way that capitalism in any form, whether of the multinational corporate variety or even through the often recycled black capitalism model, can ever be the solution to any of our problems. Scientific socialism is the antithesis to capitalism. Whereas capitalism was created and is based on exploitation, scientific socialism is based on the collective ownership of the means of production by the masses of people. Scientific socialism provides the mechanisms where Africa's mass mineral wealth can be properly evaluated, based not on the degree of profits those resources can provide the capitalists, but based solely on how we can plan to utilize those resources to wipe out poverty and suffering among the African masses using collective organization to achieve those objectives. Just a quick comment there. I think that this pamphlet is great and is written in a very clear way. If anyone's not clear on the means of production, this is a Marxist term, which basically means industrial property, uh, workplaces, factories, anything that is used to produce goods and services, the means of production. So we have two things, the mode of production, that is basically the system of property relations and property rights and law that surrounds who owns and controls the means of production. So feudalism was a mode of production. Capitalism is a mode of production. Socialism is a mode of production. Communism is a theorized mode of production that comes after socialism has had its victories against capitalism. And we've completely wiped out empire across the planet, most likely. Um, but yeah, means of production, that's really any kind of productive property, not your toothbrush, not your sneakers, not personal property, but, uh, the means by which things are produced, the means of production. Okay. Why anti-white supremacy? White supremacy was and is the racist mythology utilized by the developing capitalist classes to justify the exploitation of Africa and Africans and the theft of indigenous lands here in the Western Hemisphere. This myth has served to inoculate the masses of humanity against the barbaric terrorism that has been institutionalized against all of humanity, specifically the Africans and indigenous peoples. Consequently, it is essential that a political education focus is institutionalized, which is designed to destroy the myth of white supremacy while simultaneously killing the concept of being a, quote, American. For every person who claims to be an American, whether African, European, or whomever, every time people use that title to identify themselves, they consciously or unconsciously justify the theft of this land because if you're an American, that means that this is your land, which undermines the truth that it isn't your land. It's the indigenous people's land. It's the same as someone having possession of a stolen car and them calling that car their own despite the actual owners loudly disputing the erroneous claim. The fact that the person in possession of the car may or may not know that the car is stolen is as irrelevant to the indigenous people as it relates to the Western Hemisphere as it would be irrelevant to you if it was your car that was stolen. As for Africans who are taught to identify as Americans, this is nothing except subterfuge designed to keep us confused about our actual interests. As long as we identify with the U.S., we will never fully understand and or question the fact that the wealth in this country is maintained largely on African exploitation. If we don't see this reality, we will celebrate our individual economic advancement in this country, despite it being based on exploiting African people and resources. Even if ideally every African in the U.S. experienced economic prosperity, there's no way that this could happen without that prosperity being based on further African exploitation. Conscious Africans desire to organize our people against this exploitation, not merely position ourselves to benefit from it. This is a question of national identity as well as morality. 
So American identity equals white supremacy, and anyone who doesn't clearly acknowledge that is perpetuating white supremacy. That's why a concrete analysis on this question is unquestionably essential. Why anti-patriarchal? This is a question that raises much struggle among African people today. Contrary to what many people believe, patriarchy predates colonialism and capitalism. Patriarchy as an institution has been in Africa for thousands of years. As a result, many patriarchal institutions in Africa are often mistaken as African cultural components. Polygamy is an example here. Sokoe Torre's definitive work, entitled The History of Class Struggle, illustrates how patriarchy as an institution developed in Africa due to the evolution from communalism to slavery to feudalism. Since agriculture during this period was the dominant industry on earth, women were seen as production units due to their ability to produce children who would grow to be agricultural workers. A child-producing human can have only a maximum of a few children at once, whereas a man can produce as many children as he has partners capable of bearing children. Consequently, the institution of polygamy was solidified in Africa, and the evidence is overwhelming, indicating the stress and pressure the institution of polygamy takes on African women, but the proponents of this practice will never attempt to entertain this reality. Despite the constant efforts by primarily, but not exclusively, men to justify patriarchy, what is irrefutable is that the voices who should without question be the guiding sources on the issue are often the most ignored. For example, no African women's organization in Africa, i.e. the women's wing of the MPLA, the Organization of Angolan Women, OMA, the women's wing of the PAIGC, the General Union of Guinea-Bissau Women, UDEMU, etc., has a position supporting patriarchy. In fact, these organizations have long and militant histories fighting against patriarchal practices and even forcing their entire countries to move against those practices. Patriarchy is an institution which has completely infiltrated all faith theologies, educational curriculums, and every facet of society today, yet none of that changes the reality that it's an institution of oppression against women identifying people. So any process designed to liberate humanity must take an anti-patriarchal position. Why anti-homophobic? This question is related to the patriarchal one because homophobia evolves out of patriarchal beliefs and practices. Without question, most of the homophobic talking points expressed by Africans everywhere on earth today are textbook prepared and provided to us by unquestionable enemies of African humanity. Organizations like Samaritan Power, a right-wing evangelical organization with a multi-million dollar annual budget, led by Franklin Graham, that white supremacist evangelist son of white supremacist evangelist Billy Graham, is the force behind much of the homophobia being projected throughout Africa today and in African communities in the U.S. and other parts of the diaspora. The strange part about all of this is that proponents of this backward thinking preach African unity, but they apparently don't have the political sophistication to recognize that any unity based on excluding any element of your people is a false unity doomed to failure. Clearly, the moment we accept any isolation of any of our people is the moment we open the door to any wedge between our unity. We either believe in unity or we do not. For those of us who genuinely believe in unity, we understand that unity by definition means that we learn to accept those among us who may be different for the larger objective of liberation for the masses of African people. Today, there are ample sources of sophisticated political education that destroys the misinformation that the LGBTQ community is foreign to African culture. Whether people wish to acknowledge it or not, qualified research confirms that LGBTQ people have been around in Africa for thousands of years. In fact, there are African languages that do not even have words like he or she. The long-held argument that animals have no LGBTQ tendencies has long ago been discredited. The only thing left is political education around this history and the need for real, genuine unity among the African masses, no matter where we're from, where we live, what language we speak, what religion we practice or don't practice, or whether we are men, women, or non-binary. Bringing people together is always going to be a challenge, but the benefits will outweigh the arguments for staying disunited. This is why a strong and uncompromising anti-homophobic position is essential.
organizing the reading for the Community Defense Project's political education program. Care should be taken to ensure the material selected to read represents the ideas of revolutionary ideologues with progressive positions on the focuses identified. Some suggested authors are Kwame Nkrumah, Sako Toure, Amilcar Cabral, Asada Shakur, Walter Rodney, Oyaranki Oyawumi, Franz Fanon or Fanon, Steve Biko, Audre Lorde, Angela Davis, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Mangaliso Sabukwe, Daniel Walther, Butch Lee, Amy Garvey, Bell Hooks, Fidel Castro, Stephanie Erdang, Ernesto Che Guevara, Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Mao Zedong, Kim Il Sung, Ho Chi Minh, Lei Zuan, Muammar Gaddafi. 2. The structure of the study groups should be a standard number of pages read each week. For example, if the group meets weekly, 35 pages a week should be read. This breaks down to 5 pages per day. If people fail to meet this objective, a process, criticism, self-criticism, should be utilized to address this issue. More on this shortly. 3. Facilitating each meeting should be done on a rotating basis for everyone participating in the group. Requirements for facilitating each meeting should be the person assigned each time being required to come up with questions on that reading that are disseminated before each meeting. The rotation can be established utilizing alphabetical order. The logic behind everyone facilitating is to ensure everyone's analytical skills are being developed through this process. If everyone has to focus on the reading in the way required to come up with questions, this ensures that everyone is learning how to navigate through the material. Plus, this approach reduces the dominance of individuals, which is essential since community defense is a collective process. In essence, the connection between the political education process and community defense work is demonstrated through the example of using police terrorism against African people. If the focus of the community defense project is to organize the African community against police terrorism, a complete and analytical perspective and understanding of the history of policing in capitalist societies is required. Also, a clear understanding of the history of capitalist development, white supremacy, patriarchy, etc., are all necessary in order to understand the underlying contradictions with policing within capitalist societies. 4. Criticism and self-criticism are an essential part of this study process. This revolutionary tool was developed largely by revolutionary parties like the aforementioned Secretore led Democratic Party of Guinea. The purpose of this tool is to provide a method for participants to create a collective culture to address failures and contradictions. For example, if a person fails to complete their reading and or fails to complete a community defense assignment, like talking to community members about important developments, criticism and self-criticism is a tool to push militants to address the person with this contradiction. In today's organizing environments, what typically happens is people complain about other people's failures to everyone except the person in question. This type of liberalist behavior creates a corrosive environment. Comment, yeah, is that ever the truth? Uh, I can't tell you how many situations I've been in that have seen exactly that situation. It's, it's really bad. Continuing, with criticism, self-criticism, the criticism is taken directly to the person, but not as a weapon. Instead, the question is raised about what challenges prevented the person from reading, what challenges prevented them from carrying out the communication assignments. These criticisms are raised with a commitment from all involved to support the person in question and whatever methods are available to help them properly complete their assignment, while of course keeping responsibility on the person in question to make their best effort to improve their behavior. This approach, once institutionalized, creates a much more militant, healthy, and accountable environment, which is absolutely essential to successfully carrying out revolutionary community defense work. An example of criticism, self-criticism being implemented would be a man who is organizing in your circle is accused by a woman identifying person as talking down to people who are not men. The examples provided for this behavior is that this man talks over women constantly and berates them when they have points of view and organizing approaches that differ from what he believes. When the criticism is raised and examples provided, the man vehemently rejects the accusation. The healthy implementation of criticism, self-criticism in this instance, would be for the members of the circle, or 
if there are not people involved who are not a part of the contradiction, a structure where others outside the circle can support should be in place, to immediately involve themselves by driving the discussion beyond just the individual and subjective. This can be done by contextualizing the reality that patriarchy is an active and operational element in every interaction within this backward capitalist society. As a result, no man in this society is socialized outside of the patriarchal sphere, and in many instances, men are not even aware of the ways in which we perpetuate patriarchal behavior. The premise this collective approach brings into the discussion is an affirmation that patriarchy exists, and since we know that, women identifying people should be listened to and believed. The man should be encouraged to understand this, and the members raising this struggle should then transition to working with the man to help him practice ways to be more humanistic in his interactions. This can be accomplished by developing a course of action for how he can potentially respond to the situation in a much healthier fashion. This can be revisited officially on the agenda going forward. And the keys are the man should be held accountable for his behaviors, but he should not be treated as if he is the enemy for engaging in this behavior. Our ideological studies and struggles should be reinforcing the distinct difference between reactionary behavior, which is unconscious, and counter-revolutionary, which is conscious and planned behavior. Or, as Mao Zedong put it, we desire to cure the sickness and keep the patient. All of these elements play directly into the criticism-self-criticism process. If implemented using this approach, the best option is the man in question works through the established process of accountability and support to improve his behavior. The worse option is that the man refuses to cooperate and leaves. If the process is carried out with integrity, then even if the man leaves, which would not of course be our desired result, at least we know that we did everything within our capacity to attempt to address the contradiction in a principled manner. If the man refuses to participate, we cannot force anyone to change. And in that unfortunate instance, if he leaves, at least that means that we aren't compromising our atmosphere of principled ideological struggle to cater to people who are unwilling to admit wrong and change their behaviors. Chapter 5. Building Community Defense Work Selecting the Work So, you have a group of two or three people and you wish to initiate a community defense project in your organization, but you don't know how to start. The people are always the best medium to accomplish this. Take time to research what geographical area you think the work you want to do would be best served. Of course, the area where the majority of targeted people you wish to work with live would be the most logical location. For example, if you're interested in organizing community defense among African people, indigenous people, Asian people, women, LGBTQ, or any combination therein, you would need to choose an area where those people exist in the largest capacity. Once that community, neighborhood, etc. is selected, take 30 minutes to develop a simple survey designed to provide data you will need to structure your program. Here are some example questions for your survey. 1. What is it that motivates you to wake up each day and face this world? 2. What threatens what you care about? 3. What ideas do you have to address those threats? 4. What role are you willing to play to resolve those threats? 5. Contact information. Then the task for the three of you will be to recruit others to join you in canvassing, i.e. door knocking on as many doors as you can in that neighborhood. Your goal should be knocking on no less than 75% of all doors within a grid you establish, meaning that if you're working with a 10 block radius, you start there. If you need to start smaller, start smaller. However long it takes you to complete this is how long it needs to take. Once you complete your data information gathering, you will need to tabulate the results. The easiest way to do this is to take each of the four draft questions indicated above and parse out the results. For example, for the first question, develop categories to identify the answers provided. How many people answered by saying their families, children, etc. So if you have 3,000 responses to that question and 2,600 of those responses indicate family as their motivation, that's 87%, or a very clear majority. The same process should be completed for all the questions. Typically, the identified threat responses you will receive are not things unfamiliar to anyone even vaguely aware with activist work and oppressed communities. The following are examples of the types of answers you can expect to see repeated the most. One, 
poor education for the youth. 2. Limited nutritional resources in the neighborhood. 3. Affordable housing. 4. Criminal activity threatening community safety. 5. Predatory men. 6. Fear of police terrorism. From these types of answers, or whatever answers you predominantly receive, it will be immediately clear that the issues impacting the community are directly connected to the exploitative system of capitalism and how it preys on the masses of people. From this point, your group will need to have a discussion about what focus your work will take. It's important to keep in mind that the underlining principle of any community defense work, which is always revolutionary work, is that the work must always be centered around the masses of people, but that doesn't mean your organizing role will be devoid of agency. In other words, since we already know that revolutionary political education does not exist anywhere on any level that can be confused with dominant, do not feel compelled to view community input through a bourgeois vision. For example, if the majority of your survey respondents were to say that the dominant problem in their community is the absence of dark-skinned Africans, it would be irresponsible and idealistic for you to take the position that this should be the primary issue you organize around because, quote, this was the voice of the people. Instead, your role at this point would be to agitate the folks in your community to dig deeper, get beneath the issue of skin tone to discover what the underlying issues actually are. In this instance, the actual issue is probably class struggle between working class Africans and petty bourgeois Africans. Launching the work. Once the focus is decided, let's just say the focus will be community safety, anti-police terrorism. Organize a methodology to circle back to the community respondents who expressed the most comprehensive feedback. Those folks who gave you the most solid information. What you will most likely find is that most of those folks also were the ones who expressed the most committed desire to help carry out the work that you're preparing to do. When you circle back to those respondents, what you are seeking to further refine is what ideas those folks have for how the community would be safer. Help them by framing the questions in the context of how they would empower themselves to solve the problems, instead of a focus on the capitalist institutions of this society as the problem solvers. What should result from this second round of surveying is a much clearer focus on what work should be taking place. For the sake of this example, we will say that this work should include the following identified components. One, ongoing positive activities for the youth. Two, the community respecting the community. Three, effective ways to deal with people who prey on the community. The next step is to organize a meeting for all community members who identified a willingness to help. Pay attention to being strategic about where you hold this meeting. This session, as well as all work you carry out in this project, should be carried out in the community you're organizing in. This is an important component because it reinforces the notion that at this stage, the community is the center of the work, which reaffirms that the work is centered in the people in the community and not your organization. When planning the meeting, include the community participants in planning the agenda. Agitate around relevant discussion items. Recognize that at this stage, and all stages, you will be viewed as the leader of this community defense project. As community participants become more engaged and participate more and more in the decision making, this will even out some, but realize that as long as you stay engaged, you will continue to be viewed as a critical and leading voice in the work. Get in the practice of using this influence to further encourage people to get involved and own the work themselves. Due to how you are viewed and the respect people will bestow upon you, taking this approach will give credibility to your efforts to collectivize the work. The purpose of this first meeting should be around the following focuses. 1. What the work will actually look like, i.e. building a community security process that the community will own. 2. Organized political education process in the community. 3. Self-defense classes. 4. Community resources to address the challenges that the people face. 5. Getting all those who agree to work with the Community Defense Project at this meeting and future meetings to agree to the following. A. Agree on a name for the project, something that will resonate with the community. B. Agree to work at all times against a capitalist anti-people ideology, placing people above all else. C. Agree to work at all times against a patriarchal framework. D. Agree that the work is a safe space for all women identifying people, colonized people, 
LGBTQ folks, and all folks who are marginalized by the capitalist society at all times with a no-nonsense policy against abuse of this principle. E. Everyone committing to participate in the ongoing work-study political education groups. There are several critical factors here to keep in mind. One, the people you start with won't necessarily be the people you continue the work with. Be prepared for many starts and stops, many unkept promises, lack of follow-up, and consistency. Two, these challenges are a normal part of any organizing work. Three, if we didn't have challenges, we wouldn't need to be doing this work. Four, as Saku Torre taught us, even if we have to start over, we'll be starting over at a more qualitative point of readiness. Another key component is ensuring that everyone who is willing leaves that initial meeting with a specific assignment and that it's clear what support will be needed for those who have assignments, as well as when assignments are expected to be completed and or reported on, and that this process is institutionalized within your work. This cannot be overstated. It's also essential that when you have your reporting sessions, there must be humanistic accountability. The following elements are crucial here. One, if folks are not participating in follow-up meetings, the reasons why must be identified and struggled through using the principles of the criticism, self-criticism process. Two, if the work is not progressing, the reasons why must be discussed and solutions identified. Three, behavior that contributes to the inconsistency of work being completed must be addressed utilizing the principles identified in the criticism, self-criticism section. Four, any and all victories, no matter how insignificant they seem, should be highlighted at all times. Organizing plan objectives. The structure of your political organization and mass meetings are suggested to be carried out using a format similar to the following. One, ideological discussion, at least one hour of discussion about your assigned reading. Two, restatement of objective of your community defense project in the form of the pledge about your project planks, i.e. anti-white supremacy, patriarchy, etc., or other ways to reinforce the vision, message, and work. Three, reporting on assignments, updates, discussion of issues, statement of next steps. Referring back to number two, the example we're utilizing here is safety for the community, so specific focus points for developing this work can be, one, what is your core goal with the project? An example can be to push the community to recognize the following components. A. African people all over the world can and will organize wherever they are to create mechanisms that can serve our people against any and all enemies, and that in doing so, we are connected internationally and will act as one. B. As a part of number one, we do not ever need to rely upon and call police agencies of any kind. In fact, we affirm that police and military institutions are instruments of the forces oppressing us. 2. What will be the core tenets for your project? A. Political education throughout the community by virtue of study groups of 3 to 13 people everywhere. B. Mass conflict de-escalation trainings offered on a continuous basis. 3. Mass beginning self-defense trainings focused specifically on women identifying persons offered on a continuous basis. E. Mass organizing 101 trainings offered on a continuous basis designed to train the community on how to interact and engage with one another in a positive and productive manner, especially in areas connected to carrying out the skills being trained, self-defense, etc. F. Embrace everyone in the community who wishes to become a positive member in the community and is willing to do whatever work is required to grow in that capacity. G. A no-tolerance policy for people who engage in activities designed to prey on the community. Sex trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, drug dealing, other violence against the community. These persons, where clear evidence exists of their participation in these vile activities, should be addressed through organized delegations of community members, speaking to them, and advising them in clear terms that such behavior will not be tolerated. Of course, a level of organization of the project must exist before this capacity is possible. Resources needed. Backing up to the research portion of the project development, a major portion of this research should be focused on what will be needed to carry out this work. 
Here is a partial list of some of the standard resources that will be required. 1. A physical location to have consistent interactions. A small hall with floor space would work best, especially if there are chairs and tables available. A large apartment complex recreation room sometimes fits this purpose. Amazingly, these venues are often available free of charge. Often, housing units in the middle of the chaos are desperate for solutions. They understand that the institutions of the capitalist system are not going to solve these social issues. So simply approaching them and explaining your purpose is often more than enough for many of them to enthusiastically offer their services. But any location that provides enough space, a room for at least 50 participants, will do. Actually, an apartment complex with 100 to 500 residents can be an ideal location to start a project. Wherever you choose to attempt to initiate your work, a great talking point to the people you are negotiating space with is to hammer in on the benefits to the community and the fact that you're doing this work for the good of the community and not any particular entity that would benefit financially or otherwise. 2. Identify what skilled people you will need to help you carry out your work. Examples A. Licensed counselors and therapists who agree to treat people from your project area free of charge. B. Transportation entities like taxi companies owned by colonized people, for example, who will agree to transport people who need it on a consistent basis free of charge. C. Self-defense instructors and experts who agree to train people for free. D. Conflict de-escalation trainers who agree to train people for free. E. Organizations who will agree to donate resources for the consistent purchase of food for meetings and events, etc. F. DJs, or at least people with DJ and or sound equipment, who will agree to permit their equipment to be utilized for events. G. Community partners, organizations, churches, etc., who are progressive enough to support your organizing efforts. H. People who have technical skills in areas like computer programming, graphic design, etc., who will volunteer their services to help. I. People trained and licensed legally who will agree to volunteer to assist. J. People with medical training who agree to provide training free of charge. K. People experienced in transformative and restorative justice practices and implementation who will volunteer to train people free. A data bank of these resources should be housed for easy access. Chapter 6. When Your Community Defense Project is Underway The initial steps laid out up to this point are very difficult steps indeed, but the most difficult element of any project is maintaining the consistency that the work will continue, especially after people begin to transition, which is an unavoidable feature of this work. People, even some of the original and hardest working organizers, will transition out, often with no advance notice. Sometimes this happens for perfectly understandable reasons, like loss of employment, death in the family, or other levels of human crisis. This is an exploitative capitalist system. Tragedy is the most common denominator for most of us. That's why doing this work is even necessary in the first place. Prepare yourselves for this because it is going to happen, and when it does, it will force more of a burden on those holding those initial stages of the work, and even more advanced stages. So, as difficult as the initial stages are, the continued work will prove to be even more challenging. So, despite all of the challenges, what tools do you use to assess the progress of your project? Here is a basic model that can help you determine how your work is progressing. 1. Your targeted community area consists of 1,500 residents, and you've successfully engaged in conversations about your project with a minimum of 75% of the adult age persons in your area of work. Assuming that number is about 900 people, you should be able to say that you've talked to at least approximately 675 of those 900 people. And by talk to, we mean that you've been able to talk to them about the work enough to determine an assessment that you can apply to them. For example, one, meaning that they are supportive and willing to assist, two, that they are supportive theoretically, three, that they're indifferent to the work that you're doing, four, they're opposed to the work you're doing, and five, they're actively organizing people against your community defense efforts. Once you've reached this point, you aren't going to stop talking to people. This element of your work will never cease. 
We don't have access to large media sources, so our one-on-one -on -one conversations are our most vital organizing tool. As a result, this work should always continue, but at least this mark gives you a gauge to determine that you've reached a point where you can provide a clear perspective on where the community stands in relation to your work. Two, of the people you've reached, your assessment, one through five, should be a minimum of 75% in support with one and two and being the qualified definition of support. This means roughly 500 people in support. Of those 500 people, your goal should be to have 100 of them at a bare minimum, being reliable and committed to carrying out the work as defined as carrying out at least some level of assignment, from coordinating some elements of the program to at least telling friends about the work and to support and participate. Since the majority of your ones and twos will be twos, probably about 80% of them, that means you will only have about 20 to 30 people who will turn out to be actual dedicated workers on your project. Properly organized though, 10 to 20 people can accomplish a lot. By accomplishing a lot, we mean ensuring that the following work is taking place on a consistent basis. One, having two or three people assigned specifically to make sure that the mass political education groups and meetings are happening on a consistent basis. Two, one or two people ensuring that the mass meetings, your main mechanisms designed to continuously serve as a mechanism to keep the community informed of your work, are happening consistently. Three, one or two people assigned to keep track of all trainings to ensure that they are happening on a consistent basis. Four, one or two people assigned to keep your data bank up to date to ensure the resource people that you identified haven't moved, disappeared, retired, etc. Five, one or two people to ensure continued recruitment and promotion around the work is taking place consistently. Six, a team of coordination persons who will organize community-led teams to confront and address problematic people functioning within the community. From these crucial tasks, we've identified 11 to 15 people, with 15 committed and dedicated people, with two or three more to help conduct overall communication. The work can be effectively coordinated and carried out by this handful of people, 15 to 20. Measuring progress. The objective of any organizing work is to build capacity and leadership among the people you're working to organize. This is one of the most misunderstood components of organizing work. We will use the method in which the work of the AAPRP over the last few decades has been misunderstood to underscore this important point. From the late 1970s through the 1990s, the AAPRP made the strategic decision to organize 100% on college campuses throughout the U.S. For those of us who have been longtime AAPRP organizers, we remember clearly the constant barrage of critiques aimed at us from individuals and organizations. The content was always the same. Why are you just organizing on college campuses? The college students are not the segment of African people suffering the most, so why are you all there? Where is your work for the masses of African people not on college campuses? Aren't you all attempting to revive W.E.B. Du Bois, long discredited, even by himself, talented 10th argument? The talented 10th philosophy of early on Du Bois was often applied by confused persons against the college campus work of the AAPRP, but the comparison was never accurate. Du Bois' theory advanced the elitist notion that the segment of Africans who acquired college education and skills should be the elements from our communities who lead our communities. This was a bourgeois position that the later pan-Africanist socialist Du Bois completely rejected. What the AAPRP did with its campus focus had absolutely nothing to do with creating any class of petty bourgeoisie professionals who would lead anything. Instead, our focus was on developing the African intelligentsia, which has historically proven to play a pivotal role in sparking movements all over the world. Anyone who denies that simply has not studied history. The focus on college campus organizing was a strategic one. If one seeks to catch fish, logically speaking, one must go to the water. If one seeks to catch African intelligentsia, it meets equal logic to go to the places where intelligentsia are being trained. That is not to say that Africans on college campuses are prepared to do revolutionary work. It's understood that every single African on college campuses is there to be directed to become a middle manager 
for the capitalist system, i.e. petty bourgeoisie. Our work on the college campus, of which I am a product, was to push the college students to denounce the petty bourgeois track and instead commit to using their skills and education to spark the masses towards revolutionary pan-Africanist organizing work. To encourage the training of educators, communicators, media persons, science trained, to commit to use their skills for the African revolution. And by using their skills, we mean working with the masses to spread ideas of revolutionary pan-Africanism, to make those ideas dominant. Despite this being completely ignored by the critics, nowhere in any AAPRP literature or practice were these students promoted as the leaders of anything. Their job is always to spark the true leaders, which are the masses of Africans. So a quick comment there from me. Um, I really enjoyed that section that resonated with me. So for my own part, uh, I was always good in school from an early age, was successful, was probably on a track for something more like upper management, not even middle, but I didn't want it. Um, the closer I got to that system, the people that I was meeting, uh, the culture that I was exposed to, getting closer to the bourgeoisie, uh, I thought it was vile. I mean, it disgusted me, like profoundly. Uh, I, that wasn't what I had grown up around. And the closer I got to, you know, making adult choices about the way my life was going to be, um, I really knew that I didn't want that. So it took me a little while, but I eventually figured out, well, for example, starting this podcast, um, you know, and applying those skills that I had gained throughout my education for exactly that the job of trying to spark the true leaders in the masses because, you know, I can sit here and podcast all day long. It's like flicking a lighter, you know, you get the, the spark there, but unless you also get the fuel going, you're not going to have a sustained burn. You're not going to have a flame. So that's the thing, you know, to me last year in 2020, when there were mass uprisings, um, that was great. <laughs> I mean, that's what needs to happen. And, you know, as I have tweeted recently, uh, you know, a day without mass uprisings in the USA is a day that doesn't entirely make sense to me. So, you know, it is our job as communists to spark the masses and uh, to act in their own interest. So, you know, it's basically what we're trying to do. I know that uh, ultimately... You know, I'm a guy putting stuff on a broadcast and doing these recordings and just trying to put them out there for people to listen to. Ultimately, though, it does take this last step of organizing people actually getting busy out there in the world and really doing things. I mean, it's not all uprisings all the time. You got to do relationship building and community building and all that stuff. But the point being that things like this are just the spark and, you know, Anybody who tries to make a podcast or something, you know, like that out to be revolutionary, it isn't, you know, it's agitation. And if you're doing it well, it's education as well. But the organization, that's something that happens separately. And a lot of times, you know, because of our culture of celebrity media worship, people can get really wrapped up in whether it's a musician who has radical politics or an artist or a writer or, you know, a comedian, entertainer, or something. People oftentimes think that, you know, following that person and listening to their work is like the end of it. No, it's literally the beginning. It's just the spark. Anyway, let's continue. This is an important point because true organizing work, especially revolutionary organizing work, is about building leaders within the communities. Under this model, the actual organizer isn't ever the focus. The people you are working with always are the focus. This is why community defense work is an outstanding example of what the AAPRP model of organizing the intelligentsia is designed to accomplish. A great way for organizers to assess the progress of the community defense work is concretely connected to how many of the local neighborhood people whose doors you knocked on, who came to the initial meetings, etc., have now progressed to being the people who coordinate and hold the work. If, after a consistent period of time, you, as the initial organizers, are still the face of the project, and everyone is waiting on movement from you to do anything, and or the only work happening is what you're doing, 
this is a clear sign that critical assessment is needed. If the masses don't own the work, it will never advance. On the other hand, if you've developed a cadre of local leaders who hold the work to the level of production where you become more of an advisor, that is exactly how the work should progress in a healthy fashion. Using the AAPRP on college campuses, despite the constant criticisms against us, today we have AAPRP cadre all over the African world. In the U.S., over the last 50 years, we've contributed greatly toward helping Africans in the U.S. to have a much more favorable perspective on Africa. We've contributed mightily towards helping our people to develop an understanding of the need for solidarity with the struggles of indigenous people, Palestinian people, and others engaged in national liberation struggles. We've developed a strong anti-FBI, CIA, and anti-democratic Republican Party consciousness. All of this has happened with the college students, myself included, who have conducted thousands of programs, written material, and one-on-one -on -one work around these concepts that have informed collective consciousness. Those college students we struggled with went to their families for holidays and raised the concepts they learned from us. Their families and friends went and told their friends, and the concepts spread and took hold. The point is that if we can do that with a limited number of people, nationally here in this country, the college campus focus was always just in the U.S., a fact the critics always ignored. Imagine the vast potential for initiating this model of work within a specific neighborhood. In other words, our AAPRP campus work was successful. The only criticism of this work was that we never identified a specific formula for how many college campus produced revolutionary cadre we would consider an achieved objective. The mechanism provided here is an effort to improve upon this. So how many leaders from this community have been recruited and are working consistently? If there are enough to own and to control the work to keep it flowing based on the objectives you laid out, even if at some point you're not engaged in that particular project any longer yourself, you have serious and justifiable cause to celebrate this work. Keys to assessing the project on an ongoing basis. The tools here that must be consistently reinforced and encouraged are 1. Constant focus and practice with utilizing criticism and self-criticism as a primary method of facilitating interaction about contradictions, issues, problems, and anything that threatens to curtail the work taking place. And 2. Consistent vehicles highlighted to provide a democratic decision-making process. Democratic Centralism Although often maligned as a Stalinist tool by people who haven't spent more than five minutes studying or practicing it, democratic centralism, or DC, based on years of experience practicing it as a principle within the AAPRP, is a strong and effective tool for democratic input and implementation, especially if it is practiced hand-in-hand -hand with revolutionary criticism, self-criticism. Here are some primary components of DC. One. All issues must be discussed openly, meaning all available information on the issue must be provided consistently to everyone involved in the project. 2. Discussion must be facilitated in a way so that every possible point of view can be heard and discussed. 3. Due to the importance of points 1 and 2, democratic centralist discussions, particularly on contentious issues, are not discussions that will be carried out quickly. Often, discussions on topics can circle back and forth multiple times. This is an unwavering component of this decision-making principle, and that should be shared and discussed beforehand, so that people aren't as easily susceptible to the bourgeois notion that decisions should happen quickly and without much difficulty. This may be true for some individual decisions, but for collective decision-making, we're essentially challenging all of the classic capitalist, individualistic ways to engage in decisions. For many people, without proper inoculation, this can be seen as a negative, when in fact people openly and fully discussing and resolving issues, even with contention present, is exactly how true democracy should work. 4. Points 1 through 3 are all core democratic components of the DC principle. The importance of everyone having a voice in all decision making. The next element of DC is the centralist portion. This is the portion that has been most abused historically, and it is the abuse of this portion of the principle that fuels much of the attacks that, as previously mentioned, 
stem from people's interpretation of the Bolshevik usage of DC in Russia in 1917. We have never been followers of the Soviet model, Marxist Leninism, or any other element of the European experience. We have our own culture, and the democratic foundation of DC fits perfectly with our collective and egalitarian African culture. So, due to our cultural requirement that all of our institutions of struggle be mass in structure and philosophy, centralism as a component of DC has not posed the challenges for us that it apparently has posed for European-influenced political formations. The focus on collectivism within African culture ensures centralism remains simply a method to permit us to implement decisions and move forward, not a tool to control and or repress anyone's voice. 5. So, after full and exhaustive discussion around issues take place, and this can be defined as the point when no new analysis is being shared, and when there are no continuing questions about existing points discussed, the need to bring the discussion to a vote is appropriate. 6. The vote must permit the restatement of all positions being voted on, so that all agree with how the positions are being framed for the vote. 7. The vote must carry a minimum of 51% to carry, and that number does not include those who choose to abstain from voting. In other words, if there are 10 people participating in the discussion, and during the vote, 3 vote yes, 1 votes no, and 6 abstain, technically the vote carries. Groups usually will struggle around continuing to develop the discussion so that at least a clear majority ends up voting in favor or against, but that is how the process should work. 8. Regardless of how the 51% is achieved either way, an extremely critical part of DC is that whomever voted in a way that does not reflect the way the vote carries has a complete responsibility to work as hard as they possibly can to carry out the vote, regardless of the fact that it went against their individual position. People who find adhering to this difficult are actually saying that they don't believe in democracy unless democracy decides the way they want it to decide. The bottom line regarding democratic centralism is that when carried out with integrity, it provides a fair and democratic method along an institutional process designed to ensure decisions are made and carried out through the same democratic principles that guided the discussion and the vote around the issues. Follow-up as a general practice is essential for all aspects of the work to continue. Having regular meetings and check-ins where views can be shared and issues worked out cannot be overstated. Having these tools in place is key to keeping the work fresh and ongoing in a healthy fashion. Who gets to do the work? A common practice in today's activist circles throughout the U.S. is a well-intentioned but misdirected practice of security culture. In these environments, extensive focus is placed on ensuring people don't bring cell phones into meetings and that people who are invited to meetings to do the work are required to pass some sort of test to demonstrate that they're worthy of the trust of the existing participants. The purpose of these practices is understood, but no one engaging in these practices can demonstrate how doing these things has made their process any safer. Quick comment there from me. Um, I have heard on the cell phone issue that there was a meeting of activists and I can't remember what the demonstration was now, but uh, they made a point. It was like they had planned a number of demonstrations and the cops were there ahead of them every time and they couldn't figure out what was going on because everybody was trusted. And then they did have a meeting, another planning meeting, where nobody brought cell phones. And it was the first one that the cops weren't there ahead of them. So you tell me, assuming that that story is true, and I have no real reason to think that it wasn't, uh, that may actually be an issue. So we'll see where this goes. Okay. None of these groups have found the magic wand to eliminate sexual assault and movement work, snitching to the police, abuse towards members of the community, etc., by doing any of these things. So, again, yeah, it's not a magic wand, but cell phones have been demonstrated many times to be surveillance devices, so definitely be aware of that. On the other hand, things like sexual assault and movement work. Let me say here, I don't know if I've said it before, but I'll say it again, the movement is not a place to meet dates. There's a ton of people on social media in particular who blur this line a lot. Don't do this. 
Just don't do it. Don't look for dates in the movement. And if you see somebody who, usually this is men, of course, uh, who is, you know, repeatedly going from woman to woman, participating in this, whatever your movement is, and they're, you know, romantically interested over and over, this is not good. And maybe say to them, hey, you know, don't do that. Like, this is a place where people come to fight oppression and they already have a lot of problems in their life and they don't need things to get complicated with that. Obviously, you know, if uh, attraction strikes and things are mutual and whatever, I mean, you know, this is not about trying to police that. But there is a real issue with women being hounded in these movements by lonely men joining up and thinking that, you know, they're sort of entitled to pester women in this way. Anyway, continuing. The reason that these practices haven't effectively eliminated these dysfunctions is because the dysfunctions exist because of the backward ideology and practices of the capitalist system. This is a system built and maintained on the brutal and barbaric treatment of human beings on a larger mass scale than at any time in human history. As a result of the institutionalization of dehumanizing human beings as a profit motive, money is more important than people in capitalism. People are socialized to see people as a means to an end, and not an end all of themselves. Consequently, once people are dehumanized, it becomes easy to behave in anti-human ways towards other humans. Any security measures that do nothing to address this fundamental contradiction of human value will never address these issues. At best, we're doing things to make us feel that we're addressing the contradictions, but in truth we are not. The only way these contradictions can and will be addressed is by focusing in on strengthening the political education process. It's this process, with a strong social revolution and criticism self-criticism component, which is designed to encourage people to participate, become vulnerable about our weaknesses, and the things that we must change about ourselves and each other. This is the process that creates principled revolutionary organizers, not the practices of isolating and improvising some elitist process to make people pass bourgeois-inspired tests to prove their value. This is especially true since the supporters of this practice cannot elaborate on how their rituals have decreased police infiltration, inner organization friction and dysfunction, and the challenge of building collective power. So, commenting, they go on for a while here. I would challenge this notion that they have done nothing to protect that. Um, and this is actually inspiring me to do another article in the near future about ways to identify infiltration and things like that because it is an issue once you build an organization the cops get inside of almost everything so keeping an eye on that is really important actually um i think that they're really being overly dismissive of any kind of security practice so that is not sitting that well with me. Anyway, continuing. I mean, yeah, you can increase education and whatever, but if you have an informer in your organization, uh, all the political education in the world isn't going to protect you from that person. So I'm just not entirely sure uh, what the issue is here, but let's see what they go on to say. These practices do nothing. Okay, again, strong language, to contribute towards any of these objectives because these problems exist because of the inhuman foundation of the capitalist system that produces all of us. Until we focus our tactics on practices that address our humanity and dignity as human beings, the problems will continue to plague us. Mass political education, where thought is institutionalized, that people transcend profits, and our work must be promoted and underscored by, as Ernesto Che Guevara articulated, an undying love for humanity is the only true way to create an atmosphere of mutual respect, trust, and safety among us. For us as revolutionary Pan-Africanists, we employ the logic articulated by the 5th Pan-African Congress in 1945. The solution for the African masses is mass organization. This means we are fighting to recruit every African into our Pan-African work. This leaves absolutely no room for elitist practices that will never fit within any mass organizing efforts. All of the organizing mechanisms that we have talked about in this manual are 1. Mass organized political education 2. 
criticism and self-criticism as a tool of addressing contradictions. Three, democratic centralism as a tool for democratic input and decision-making. All of these tools, if taken seriously and used consistently, will create the new and principled revolutionaries that Kwame Nkrumah talked about, and we will do it this way, utilizing principles of humanity, dignity, and respect, while disposing of all the practices based in anti-human, non-trusting behavior. We believe that every human being has the ability to transform from reactionary to revolutionary, and with the right day-to-day -day practices engaged, we can see the results of this transformation in millions of people. So that's the end of that section. And I just want to comment again, I appreciate their perspective that, you know, being on the whole more trusting than not is important and is maybe being overlooked right now, etc. I also think they're going too far in that direction by dismissing any notion of taking care to prevent surveillance. Yes, uh, ultimately, the idea is to involve all the masses, etc., and you can't really, you know, practice security on a mass level, or at least uh, complete secrecy on a mass level, understood. But when we're talking about getting things off the ground, and you have 10 or 20 people involved, or even 5 or 10 involved, yeah, I mean, maybe don't look for a cop under every bush, but it's something to watch out for depending on what you're talking about in your organization. So anyway, I am leaving a few question marks around that one. Although, like I said, again, I appreciate the we should trust people notion because sometimes, you know, people get burned and then trust goes out the window and people become paranoid. That isn't helpful. I totally agree. But yeah, I, I think it's possible to go too far in that direction, particularly at different stages. So anyway, what do you think? Leave a comment. All right. The principles behind ideological struggle. We have discussed this approach often throughout this manual as the primary method for building and maintaining a strong community defense project. We would expand that concept and suggest that this approach will strengthen every organizing process you engage in. The engine behind effective ideological struggle on all fronts is maintaining a principled approach when utilizing the struggle as a tactical tool for forward advancement. Here are five golden rules for principled struggle that help to ensure this practice elevates your community defense work. One, take any and all disagreements you have with the people directly to those people. Avoid discussing the issues with anyone else besides the people you have the issue with. Two, Practice patient skills in listening and communicating at all times. Three, believe in your soul, the ability of all human beings to improve and advance their behavior as you would want people to believe the same about you. Four, always recognize that the moment you raise a criticism toward anyone's actions, you automatically have a responsibility to help them resolve the contradiction. Five, consciously struggle against liberalism i.e. raise up honest struggle at all times. So comment again, uh, I would just say about point one, first of all, those are really positive points and I agree on the whole. The only thing about uh, taking any and all disagreements you have with the people directly to those people, uh, that can be good, although sometimes it doesn't hurt to, in passing, bounce a grievance off of somebody else like, hey, have you noticed such and such? You know, obviously, they, what they don't want here is people, uh, you know, starting like a massive gossip campaign behind people's backs, even a small gossip campaign behind people's backs because, you know, things do get back to people. I mean, a rule that I use in my own life is I don't say things about other people out loud to anyone else that I wouldn't ultimately be comfortable with, you know, getting back to that person even at that time. So you know, consider that. If you're not comfortable with it getting back to the person, don't say it at all. Um, but yeah, I've found in my life that sometimes, you know, bouncing it off of somebody else, you might just be missing perspective. Whereas if you take it directly to the person immediately, um, sometimes it can create almost more of an issue uh, if they don't take it well and then things can blow up. Whereas, I don't know, somebody else might have been able to point out that person's point of view in a less defensive way than the person 
directly that you have the issue with or think you might have the issue with. Although I agree in principle that it's better on the whole to handle things directly. All right, continuing. Exhibit A, an example of principled ideological struggle. Botswana has come forward and indicated that Jabari has engaged her one-on-one -on -one with inappropriate conversation of a sexual nature. She says that Jabari called her about meeting to discuss an assignment for the community defense work being engaged in. After some initial surface questions and discussion about the work, Botswana said Jabari made some inappropriate comments about the style in which Botswana dresses, stating that the portions of her anatomy that are not covered by clothes makes it difficult for him to focus on the work, and that he wanted to ask her if she was sending him messages about wanting to spend intimate time together. When she responded by telling him she has no desire to do anything with him and that his suggestions are very uncomfortable for her, he responded by calling her multiple times after that while framing his desire to spend time with her more and more aggressively each time. Botswana has brought up the issue and how uncomfortable she is with having to work in the same organizing spaces as Jabari. When she does so, two other women voice similar experiences with Jabari. What happens next? is an example of how the organization decides to address this issue. It's decided that a council of four organizers, gender diverse and not including Botswana, although she supports this action, she elected not to participate in it. The team agrees to approach Jabari immediately, so the next day he is contacted and asked to meet with the team regarding a matter of extreme importance. When he asks Adisa, the person designated to reach out to him, the reason for the urgent meeting, Adisa's response is, as you know, this organization honors principled ideological struggle to resolve contradictions. So, since we always prioritize issues of behavior towards one another, some questions have come to light involving you, and in the spirit of this principled struggle, we would like to speak with you about this. Once Jabari agrees to the meeting, it's set up. When all parties are present, Intasara starts the session out by recounting the issue to Jabari. Here's an example of how the exchange goes. Jabari, I didn't say all of that to her. I just told her she dresses nice. Intasara, Jabari, none of us were there, but what we all can agree on is that whatever happened during the conversation, Botswana is uncomfortable with it. So based on our anti-patriarchy position within this work, are you willing to accept and agree that no further conversation should take place between you and Botswana? Jabari, I agree, but now my reputation is damaged, and that's not right. Adisa, What's happened is we're talking to you about this. No one else outside of this room and Botswana know about anything. The request has been just for you to stop, nothing else. She's not asking for an apology, any public statement or anything. So all you have to do is stop and nothing about who you are, your reputation, etc. is being challenged. The question we have is can you accept and respect this? Jabari agrees. Debrief. The team should debrief this conversation immediately afterward and with Botswana, and of course, continued monitoring by the team should take place. Since the organizers all agreed to the no-nonsense policy for everyone engaged in this work, the very next instance of any appropriate work by Jabari has to result in him being asked to step away from the work and reflect on his behavior through a process that should be designed to support him in doing that if he is willing to agree to such a process. If he refuses, he cannot be permitted to continue to work. This is never an ideal result, but it is the best result you can achieve when someone is unwilling to be unaccountable for their behaviors. Important note, this area is an extremely sensitive one for obvious reasons. A recommended method for addressing these types of contradictions is to seek out activist-minded and experienced organizers who have significant experience implementing transformative and restorative justice techniques who will share how to implement that work with your organizers. That's the end of chapter six. I just want to comment on that as well uh, from personal experience. I feel like maybe it's just the organizations that I've been in, but I feel like most of the accountability issues like this, these types of confrontations and things do not result in that positive of outcomes. And I'm not saying that the fault is with the process. I'm just saying that they didn't tend to work out well, where, you know, quote, Jabari agrees. More often than not, I have seen people, um, I've just seen things escalate. 
numerous times in a variety of different organizations. And I've seen conflicts like this take down, I mean, like organizations and more than once uh, over years, you know. So I guess all I want to say about that is don't overestimate people's willingness to work with that kind of process, even if they have previously agreed in the abstract to doing so. When somebody's in the hot seat, so to speak, um, you know, they can, I mean, I've seen people get extremely defensive. And also sometimes when people implement these processes, they're not always done in the most compassionate way as in this example. Like things were very straightforward in the example that they gave. Um, sometimes things can get pretty messy with even a single word or two really throwing somebody off or getting somebody's defenses up. And um, all I'm saying is that I think that people in general uh, need to be better about their willingness to engage in these processes so that when there is a problem, you know, they can be resolved swiftly. Uh, but I've often seen that not actually work out so well in practice. Again, it's not a criticism of the process, just that I don't want people to have faith in the process to the point where they don't expect there to be problems ever. Um, I wish, in fact, that they had included an example of things getting more out of hand because that actually, to me, is more often the experience that I've actually seen. I'm not prepared right now to give you an alternative, you know, case illustration. But I mean, things can get nuts. I mean, I've seen physical altercations at meetings and different things. So let me just say when there is a problem, yes, your organization absolutely, as suggested here, should have a process for resolving it. And everyone should agree up front that it's fair, etc. cetera. Um, because once you get into that situation, things can get pretty weird. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, what might actually be a healthy and useful exercise for groups is to have a practice grievance session or, you know, accountability process run as part of new membership. In other words, if everyone at, you know, within their first few months of becoming involved, you know, before a problem is likely to arise, most likely um, to have them you know, and have it be understood that it's a training and that they didn't actually do the thing, but have them say, you know, this is what would happen if someone were to say that they had a problem with something you were doing or you were accused of this or that, you know, whether it was like taking petty cash or whatever the organization, like whatever the issue is. Um, and just say, you know, if you're ever accused of something, this is what it's going to be like. And we want to just run you through it now so that you know what being, you know, in that position feels like. And before you get all invested in this organization, uh, you know, if something pops up a year and a half from now, after you're incredibly invested and you've poured your life into it, uh, et cetera, you know, this is just uh, what you can expect if something ever comes up. And then you could run a little simulation of, You've been accused of this by this person and here's how we would handle it and blah, blah, blah. But run through the whole thing as a sort of, you know, mock trial or whatever you call it in your organization. That might actually help people to uh, feel more comfortable with the accountability process and might give your organization more practice actually in rounding out problems by using feedback from those simulations. Just some thought. And, you know, you would also wind up having many more simulations than actual problems which then when you do have a problem, everyone is just, you know, not as thrown by it. Everyone will have practiced for, you know, what goes through your mind in that situation. And it may be less disruptive. I kind of wish that, you know, we had had that sort of <laughs> policy in place and those practices in place in some organizations that I've been in. So maybe that would help. What do you think? Leave a comment. All right. Continuing on to chapter seven connecting your community defense work to other work. As was previously stated, below are the benchmarks you should look to use to certify your community defense work as self-sufficient, 
with its own internal dynamisms. One, the clear and primary leaders of the project are the people from the community where the project originated from and exists within. Two, the structures established as laid out in this manual as well as other self-sustaining practices are functional and operating on a productive level. Productive defined as with collective input, feedback, and functionality. Three, most importantly, the political education processes within the neighborhood remain fresh, full of active participation, and are the backbone of all work taking place. Connecting your work. Most often, the dominant tendency within U.S. activist circles from every community is for the work to be isolated and maintained within limited circles of participation. There's probably never been a time when productive and dynamic community defense work has not been taking place in countless communities, but most often, the people engaged in that work are primarily the only people who know about its existence. There are multiple reasons for this. One, capitalist socialization is always based in individualism and isolation, so these practices become not only the ways in which we carry on in our private lives, but the principles we rely on in our political work. Two, the communication resources for revolutionary organizing work are always extremely limited and in most cases almost non-existent. Three, the U.S. government's immoral and illegal counterintelligence programs have created a dominant atmosphere of distrust within activist circles. The irony in all of these realities is increased exposure of our work doesn't increase our risk. I would agree with that. Instead, increased knowledge and exposure strengthens our work and builds our capacity. By doing so, we create the reality where we can learn and be inspired by one another, which increases our capacities. Using the same organizing skills that we used for outreach to launch community defense, we must use those same techniques to reach out to other activist circles and works. Other work happening within our cities, towns, states, this country, this world. We can effectively utilize the following tactics to increase our communication. One, use simple tools like social media to find out what work is taking place. Two, take time to properly research other work taking place so that you have a pretty clear idea what that work consists of, who's doing it, and how it connects to the overall mission of your work. Three, use any and all communication mechanisms to reach out to other projects like phone, email, social media. Introduce yourselves and your work and ask groups if they're willing to share information about the work taking place. If they aren't, move to other groups. If they're open to this possibility, talk to them about the following opportunities. A. Presentations to each organization on the work you're doing. B. Presentations can be carried out in person and or virtually. C. Discussion should take place about how each organization can mutually support the work collectively. D. Brainstorm ways that can expand public consciousness about your work in ways that advance the work. E. Brainstorm ways your two groups can reach out to other groups and continue to expand the connections and relationship building for community defense work. Think of the possibility of community defense projects in multiple cities forming relationships and connections with one another. Imagine the potential of multiple African communities unifying around our African liberation struggle and our community defense work. Imagine African and indigenous communities forming unity pacts. Developments like these can make monumental contributions towards building unity among oppressed people everywhere. And since our strength is our unity, this happening makes victory so much easier to obtain. Chapter 8. Community Defense Work, A Summation. Many of the details displayed throughout this manual for how to construct a community defense project are structured around the core elements necessary to build and maintain the work, but the ideological aspects that guide the work should never be overlooked or underappreciated. The basis behind any human action is always the ideas that guide that action. As Kwame Nkrumah said, thought without action is empty and action without thought is blind. With this perspective firmly cemented within the work, it should always be understood that community defense work should never be seen as isolationist work, not connected to the larger struggle for human dignity and forward progress. Also, community defense work is not mutual aid work. Work that is defined as mutual aid work, i.e. providing much-needed resources to the community, is vital work, 
but it differs from community defense work in the sense that while mutual aid work can happen with people who have no consciousness about each other's political ideas and objectives, for example, people coming together to feed people in the community can do that without any inkling about the politics of the people they're working with to carry out the work since their only objective is providing food. In community defense work, all of the work is always guided by these ideological principles, and these principles should be revolutionary principles. In other words, everyone engaged in the revolutionary community defense project should be guided by the same revolutionary ideological tenets. Comment. In other words, this is more political work where the member's politics matters more because the product is not just a basket of food or a cash donation or whatever, as in mutual aid work, which is, again, needed sometimes. But that basket of food, you could say it's a political act to engage in mutual aid work versus not. But, you know, forming that bucket brigade of resources it doesn't really matter so much what the other people's politics are, per se, as long as the stuff gets there. Anyway, continuing, this is important because a community defense project designed around creating greater community safety is a project where police are unquestionably seen as the enemy of the community. This is a revolutionary position rooted in people power and police abolition. Any effort to remove revolutionary politics from community defense work can result in the work becoming defanged by reformist attacks against its intent. Police abolition becomes police reform, and your community defense project can easily turn into another bourgeois police community process, where the community is unwittingly turned into snitches for the police, which disempowers the masses while strengthening the state and police. The only way to prevent this type of community co-optation is for the work to stay firmly rooted in revolutionary political education, using the example of community safety with a revolutionary political education focus, this work is only one component in a broader effort to organize people, not just to abolish police, but to do so in the context of creating a revolutionary society where people organize the state to represent people's interests instead of repressing them. In the case of the objective behind this manual, it's specifically to organize community defense efforts across the U.S. as a part of our worldwide revolutionary pan-Africanist work. As we advance that work, the idea is that we gain an advantage in the political ideology arena in Africa. From this, we can hopefully begin to contribute to the mass uprisings happening in Africa today. Millions of Africans all over the African continent continue to rise up and protest everything from worker exploitation to homophobia to police terrorism to neocolonialist corruption. Most of that is spontaneous and the protests in Nigeria Kenya, the Congo, Algeria, Zimbabwe, etc., are not organized in conjunction with one another. What we plan to do with our organizing efforts is to create mass political party work that unites and increases the organization of these uprisings, where we create the capacity to engage enough people in ways that can effectively shut down operations as a tactic to increase the consciousness around these anti-exploitation issues while building intense pressure on the capitalist system. While this is happening throughout Africa, the value of community defense work throughout the US and Europe, the Caribbean, Canada, Australia, and Central and South America and Asia is that for community defense to serve, using the Pan-African struggle as an example, as the US branch for that Pan-African struggle. When Africans effectively shut down the Zionist-controlled diamond industries throughout Africa, we're going to need Africans in Europe, the US, and the rest of the capitalist world to ensure that not one diamond moves an inch, that it stays in the diamond mines in Zimbabwe, Azania, South Africa, Zambia, the Congo, Sierra Leone, etc. We are going to need Africans in the U.S., anywhere, to ensure that not one product produced anywhere moves anywhere. Rubber, diamonds, gold, cobalt, which is involved in cell phones, laptops, flat screens, etc., lithium, which is used in car batteries, bauxite for aluminum products, steel, zinc, as in automobile production, etc. Not one product is moving. The community defense projects designed to organize communities is done with the intent through the political education program as well as the practical work, which will help the participants realize how powerful and effective they can be to move those participants beyond just the focus on the neighborhood where they live, but to the world that produces the conditions that shape their neighborhoods. 
With this level of consciousness, people can begin to understand their role in Los Angeles, New York, Houston, etc., is to build capacity to challenge the conditions that oppress people not just in their cities and towns, but throughout Accra, Nairobi, Joburg, Dakar, Asmara, etc. With this vision, community defense work is done on a neighborhood level with the intent of building a worldwide vehicle for systemic change. This gives life to the cliche, think globally, act locally. Here's to the sincere hope that this manual can contribute to organizing efforts all throughout the African diaspora in the U.S., as well as encouraging the production of similar manuals for organizing efforts in Europe, Canada, the Caribbean, Central, and South America, and the rest of the world. Until Africa is free, no African anywhere will be free, and Africa as one unified socialist continent will contribute towards the worldwide march towards scientific socialism, leading to world communism, which will advance the entire planet towards everlasting peace. So that's the end of the audiobook. A little over two hours here. Hopefully this was interesting to you. I think for for people who have never been involved in organizations in particular, probably this was some new information and new ideas. I really encourage people to get involved in organizations. Obviously this particular manual is about Pan-Africanism and of course they also encourage other communities to form similar community defense organizations, etc. Uh, I think that this was a really good read. We're going to be doing more Pan-Africanist materials here at Socialism for All. And, uh, you know, I I really didn't have too many criticisms of this document at all. Uh, I hope no one finds inappropriate the criticisms that I did make, which really were less critical. The the only thing I would characterize as a criticism, actually, was the idea that, for example, not bringing in cell phones does not absolutely nothing. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, you're kind of proving a negative in that case. That was, I would say, the only criticism per se. But I hope that nobody finds my, you know, just feedback in general on this inappropriate. It's entirely just from my own experience and intended to be helpful. Um, So the only other things I would say is regarding other organizations. um, There was a mention way in the beginning when they were listing different organizations of Black Hammer. I'm not exactly sure when this guide is from uh but i know that in the last year or two uh there's been a lot of really negative press about black hammer for some actions they've done that other people have considered pretty weird and uh even suspect not to single them out too much but they're kind of the only one on the list that stands out to me as uh having gotten that kind of reputation so it seems to be a fairly um recently published pamphlet but um Anyway, I would encourage people to check out all of those different organizations. Obviously, I can't vouch for all of them uh, personally, but anytime that you see a list of organizations or activists to check out, running down those leads can take you to some really interesting places. You know, you can get real familiar with where your current research and experiences have taken you. Sometimes just taking that list of a rec- you know, recommended list of organizations or activist leader names and running them down, even if you're totally unfamiliar, can take you into some really helpful but unknown places that, you know, maybe you would just not go to otherwise, or it might take you five or 10 years otherwise to stumble onto them more organically. So that can definitely be uh, really helpful. So I endorse that as a general process of trying to expand your horizons. The other thing I would mention organization-wise is what they say there at the end about not letting your community defense project become co-opted and you know turn into some other you know police auxiliary that's the insistence on revolutionary politics that rejects the capitalist state and that's sort of why you're doing it in the first place this is why one of the things that i insist on this channel is that the fundamental task of the u.s left is to break completely with the democratic party and with all capitalist political parties democrat GOP, Libertarian, whatever else. Um, the only one I can vaguely support is the Green Party, uh, although there's you know a left wing of the Green Party and more of a you know hippie capitalist wing or side of the Green Party as well. So you know, be aware of what you're getting into. But the idea there is that not necessarily that you know joining uh, PSL or like voting for the Green candidate or whatever it is is gonna spontaneously result in socialism 
But the idea is that making networks and organizations of people, whatever they are, as long as they have, you know, meet certain criteria, certain ground rules, they're not corporate, they're not tied to the Democratic Party, etc. You have just greatly increased your chances of creating an independent, non-cooptable, left working class organization, uh, whatever the specific focus is, whether it's pan-Africanism or so on, you know, any anti-capitalist uh, type of focus, just doing it outside of the purview of the Democratic Party, you're giving yourself and, you know, your community, your organization, you're giving yourself that independence. You're giving yourself that freedom to embrace revolutionary politics, which, as we know, parties like the Democrats, which are owned by the one percent, explicitly reject and are out to crush. They're not just neutral towards it. They're out to stop uh, and, and just do whatever they can to either pick you off and get you to join them or crush you and shut you down. So, you know, there's real value in having those independent networks. It lets you set your own policies. And I understand that there has been even some issue, I believe, within DSA of like, what is their attitude towards police? And I'm sorry, but, you know, they do some good local activism on this or that, you know, uh, trying to get the minimum wage raised or whatever in, in different places around the country. Okay, great. But if you <laughs> can't even say we reject the police, you're not for real. That's not serious. So anyway, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, what did you think? Leave a comment below. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to support, patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. All those donations are encouraging. They're also materially helpful. So thanks. If you'd like to help the channel without a donation, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting will definitely do that. Helps to boost the channel in the algorithm and sharing it to different social media uh, platforms helps to put it in front of new eyeballs and expand the conversation that way. Whatever it is that you do in your community and online to spread the conversation about socialism, these are definitely pretty critical times to be doing that kind of work. So thanks for doing it, and we will catch you in the next video.